A way hotter than expected CPI report this morning just evaporated any hope that the market had of a Fed rate cut in the month of June. And rightfully so, small caps and market breadth really took a majority of the hit. But is it actually enough to get the S&Ps to break down more aggressively? Let's answer that question by looking at all of the data points and building a game plan based on logic for the remainder of this week. As always, check out the links listed down below in the description, hit the thumbs up button and subscribe for 100k by May and stay tuned until the end of today's show. I've got three additional trade ideas to share with you that you won't want to miss. With that said, let's jump right into the charts. So let's kick things off with a closer look at the SPY daily time frame chart and firstly ask and answer the question, what do we see in terms of the overall trend? The trend is certainly changing here with previous lows, lows, higher lows, higher low is offered over 517.25. We know that we gave it the benefit of the doubt here. Technically a lower low, we called it an equal low. And then of course, things dramatically changed last Thursday with the big time lower low. There's no ignoring that one. And now the current trend count says that we have lows and lower lows. Notice where we're sitting sort of on an equal low. In terms of our highs, we had highs, equal highs, equal highs. This is certainly a firm lower high. This is not a soft lower high because we actually did flip into an hourly uptrend here and have reversed all the way back down to the equal low off of 521 rejections. So in my view, we're actually drifting into a very short term and nuanced daily downtrend here sitting on an equal low. And if we're just trading trends, typically in downtrends, we're looking for equal low breakdowns. So into the end of this week, what I'd be highly interested in is whether or not the S&Ps can fail underneath 512 for a trade into 509. Now 509 is incredibly interesting because in the past, we know that we not only had previous resistance then act as support once, but two times and even three times here. So these three equal lows, all very, very precise in nature, actually represent the improper end of the auction at that particular level. It's also the lower edge of this week's expected move. And our daily 50 SMA in blue here is going to be meeting us for super support. Once again, that level is at 509. So what I would love to see is the market come and trade down into that level, possibly break it to repair this as a structurally weak level. And then we'll determine whether or not we produce lower high consolidation below, in which case I believe over the longer time horizon, the NVIDIA earnings gap is a threat. Or if we actually trade back over 509 with a higher low, that would really show me that we have the repair of this poor structure. A higher low back above keeps the weekly higher time frame trends intact. There's a test of our daily 50 SMA, which we have not done in a very long time. And the market can continue to balance here on the daily time frame chart, really building out what might start to appear as more of a wider balance range, something like this. So my interest into the end of this week is really what the test of 509 reveals. And the reason I'm leaning a little bit more bearish into the end of this week is not only because of the hot CPI report, but take a look at the actual structure of the daily bars. On Friday of last week, we actually closed back above our key level here at 517.25. Monday all day is above, consolidating there. We got balance. Tuesday is incredibly interesting. I'll show you why I believe this is just a short squeeze into the close of business there. Nobody wanted to go home short into a CPI print. Um, and we'll see that on the hourly chart, right? But we close over 517.25 nonetheless. And today, look at the upper wick of the bar, certainly rejecting and showing sellers actually stepping up underneath that level. So to me, this bearish inverted hammer that actually tried to get into the Tuesday range closed underneath Tuesday's low and is still offering sort of an equal low breakdown into the end of the week. For, for those reasons, I would lean a little bit more bearish here looking for that test of 509 to determine what the next structural move is from the market at that level. Once again, consolidation underneath. And over time, I would certainly be thinking about the NVIDIA earnings gap close. If we sweep it and then higher low back above, so this key inflection point right here, just breaking back above is not enough. You need to offer the higher low. That would start to look more like repairing the poor structure from in the past and in an attempt to keep the daily and weekly trend more neutral inside of this box. Let's get more granular though on the hourly. So here we can clearly see the offering of consecutive lower highs into this week and also starting from Monday lows, lower lows, and today lower lows. So it's definitely fair to say that the hourly trend is in the downward direction. But let's ask ourselves and get a little bit forensic with the price action. Do we have stronger sellers or do we have stronger buyers or neither? If you actually take a look at today's session, you'll clearly notice the lower high on what appears to be mostly a gap fill reversal on the second hourly bar of the day's session. And notice after that gap, 
gap fill reversal, we actually print a new low of day. Here's the low of day off of the open. Here's the new low of day into the mid afternoon. That new low of day is also a breakdown underneath the Thursday low of last week. So you would think if we have stronger momentum style sellers entering this market, or even just longs with terrible location from up here, who are closing out liquidating their positions, you would have expected follow through in the downward direction, perhaps looking for that 509 level that we just described on the daily time frame chart. It simply didn't happen. And you can clearly see the close over not only the Thursday low of last week, but the opening print of today's session. We did not technically close red on the S&Ps during today's trading session. So that is the first indication to me that says, although it was a nasty gap down, and although yes, there was a hot CPI release, we didn't actually see follow through from the sellers today. So okay, sellers, eh, not really that strong. We'll see a little bit of a different story on the market internals. But let's move on to the buyers. Do we have stronger buyers entering this market? And clearly the answer is no. First of all, we are in a hourly downtrend, right? And you'll notice that there was some response off of these lows, but it's not like we closed at or near 517.25, never mind above 517.25. And we can actually look back to the action of Tuesday's end of day rally right here. If you take a closer look at Tuesday's session, about midday, there was the offering of a lower high underneath 517.25. And things were looking fairly good for continuation in the downward direction until this end of day ramp. So if we ask ourselves what type of buyers would in a hurry rush to either buy positions or close out shorts into the end of day, it's short term traders who do not want to have any positions on ahead of the CPI quote unknown, even though, as we know, it was leaked early to JP Morgan and BlackRock. So this strikes me as short squeeze and short covering, not necessarily new money buyers looking to become active in the market. And then just even beyond that, if we did have new money buyers and CPI was going to be fine, right? Technically speaking, from a pattern point of view, great, you've got a double bottom, you've got a neckline, buyers should have held above. Obviously not the case with the consolidation underneath. So with all of that understanding, I would tend to side more so with the bears building an edge considering we are in an hourly downtrend and considering some of the comments we just made on the daily time frame chart as well. If we come in with the Fibonacci's from the top of the Thursday breakdown move from last week to the newest low that was just produced today's low of day, notice that the gap fill reversal or just the highs of today's rejection are still underneath the 38.2. So in the grand scheme of things, this is really bear flag consolidation as long as we're underneath 517.25. If we come in with our anchored view apps on the hourly time frame chart, you'll also notice that we're underneath the entire spread, right? And really, you're getting a lot of confluence near that 517.25. So as of right now, I would continue to maintain more of that bearish stance as long as we're underneath that key inflection point. So walking forward into the end of this week, a couple of pathing ideas for us would look something like opening in range is fairly neutral with a bearish edge. I would look for an equal low breakdown on any bearish patterns, possible lower highs under 512. And you guys know the deal. The target is at 509. If there's going to be a breach of the weekly expected move, then I would start thinking about if we just go back to the daily time frame chart, there is a pretty interesting level here at 505, 505. Okay, so keep that in your back pocket if we need it, but back on down to the hourly. So we're clear on how to get there, right? Consolidation, equal low breakdowns underneath today's low of day, lower highs underneath 512, 509, 505. If it's going to be a move in the upward direction, this is still counter trend to me. I would still be thinking about the offering of an hourly lower high, highs, lower highs, lower highs, lower highs, and also a daily lower high sustaining underneath 517.25, rejecting these anchored view apps, as well as the Fibonacci 38.2 that we just described. So when we get to the 517.25, we're thinking about what's the opportunity for double top, what's the opportunity for head and shoulders. And as you guys also know, a very simple inverted hammer on the hourly time frame chart could also do it. Looking to go short underneath the low. And of course, you would just start walking down your targets. And over time, the equal low would be the main target into the end of this week or even early next week to really change my tone out of the spiders to see a, a lackluster breakdown, if you will. It would have to be a break here consolidation. That's a good first step. I'm fairly neutral in this zone. Show me the higher low over 517.25. Then perhaps I'm interested in changing my tone a little bit more uh, solidly uh, to align with the higher weekly time frame chart and that this was maybe nothing more than a flash in the pan. But as of right now, if we're underneath that 517.25, becomes very difficult to do. The last thing I'll sort of present to you is the look below and fail situation, the repair of this 509 level. If we zoom out on this a little bit, you can see equal lows, equal lows, equal lows, all very precise. So if we see this equal low breakdown into the end of the week, something that does this on Thursday, and then Friday opens, sweeps the level, and intraday on Friday, if you could spot a higher low over an opening print, screens 
go from red to possibly green on the day. If you can get that higher low over 509, I would be trading in the upward direction, but only for a short term scalp into 512 until we can clearly flip the hourly trend and then say, aha, we've repaired the bottom end of this structure. The daily trend remains neutral. When the hourly trend flips to up more concretely via some sort of stronger, higher low opportunity, that's where I would look to play ping pong inside of the overall daily range that we're possibly suggesting that would look something like this. That would also be a hold of your daily 50 SMA. If we take a look at the market internals, this is going to give us some insight into who's actually in control. And once again, maybe shift some of the thinking a little bit more bearish and thinking about the downside first and not a miraculous recovery up and over 517.25. Look at the volume flows on today's session. So even though the market went sideways for a bulk of the day, it's not like a majority of companies across the NICE exchange were actually recapturing the previous day's closing print, which granted was quite far away, but volume outflows were substantial. So selling pressure is real here. If we take a look at the advanced decline line, same commentary over here. One comment about this sort of maybe that acts as a counterpoint is that this is way over correlated. Typically, you cannot sustain an advanced decline line that's this inverted or just deep underneath negative 2000. So it wouldn't strike me as being unreasonable if the market continues to stretch to the downside into that equal low breakdown. Let's go here to the hourly chart again. If we stretch into this 509 on still quote, oversold internals or over correlated, I should more appropriately say internals here out of the advanced decline line, I would not be surprised in the slightest to see a rebound back in the upward direction for that counter trend move that we've just described. But keep in mind, what's the issue there, right? You're still running into uh, highs, lower highs, lower highs, lower highs, you could still set a lower high on the back test of 512, this equal low breakdown point, right? So still thinking counter trend to the hourly downtrend that's already in force and the developing daily downtrend based on this being over correlated. So hopefully that's somewhat actionable, right? If we look at the cumulative build out of the tick as well, notice this, you know, huge, just there's no other way to put it. It's just a huge build to the downside. Typically, we associate substantial reads with negative 5,000. This was well underneath that today, almost negative 8,000, as you can see in this little box right here. So when we think about holistically who was in control of the market, I would tend to side more so with the sellers, but just understand that you might be coming into an exhaustion style move off the bottom end and the daily 50 SMA of this area right here. If you were to think about where the ideal location is for a new money short, if you're a trend trader, right, you typically do not long higher highs, right? So what you wouldn't do in an uptrend, you wouldn't do in a downtrend. You would not short a lower low into the 50 SMA. Right? You would actually be a buyer there for a counter trend move and then favor the short opportunity on the lower high setup. So that's my take out of the S&Ps. You guys can probably hear I'm leaning a little bit more bearish because of the structure and the internals of the supporting evidence. But let's continue along to the market profile. So over here, there are actually two bearish data points that we should explore. The first one's fairly straightforward, where when we track the point of control and value area from Monday, here is Tuesday and here is today's Wednesday session. It's clearly drifting in the downward direction. The icing on the cake is the fact that the point of control today, the fairest price to do business, the price where the most contracts were traded, it's actually underneath the Tuesday low of day. So that's progress for our sellers. The next one is actually bearish because it represents a failure from the buyers, right? One of the concepts we talked about in the weekend update was that we had thin volume at price representing poor structure, right? So in theory, the biggest area of resistance would have been over here around 52.93. We also had a poor high on Friday of last week's session. So if we extend that off to the right, Right. Notice that we actually broke and repaired that poor high on the Tuesday morning session, and there was absolutely zero retracement through the thin structure into the relevant area of resistance around 5292. So because the buyers failed to do their job over here, it wouldn't really strike me that we have stronger buyers getting active in this market and therefore once again, just stacks up as another bearish data point. Let's change gears now to the QQQ NASDAQ 100 on the daily time frame chart. What do we see here in terms of the overall trend? I think in the grand scheme of things, we still want to acknowledge that this is very much so just a daily balance range, but it's starting to build a little bit more of a bearish edge now. And there's really two reasons for that. Number one is that we broke down from here, preventing the opportunity of a daily higher low. Secondly, on the breakdown, we went directly to the bottom end of the range, creating equal lows. And then from here to here, we now have a lower high with the offering of a loosely equal low. It's not all the way there, and I would certainly concede from a nuanced perspective, yes, 
there's maybe technically speaking the offering of a higher low. So neutral with maybe some downward pressure on the close now underneath 438.50. And yes, we have adjusted some of the levels to more accurately reflect some of the price balances that we've been dealing with. So if you accurately track our levels, please update to what we have on the screen currently. As long as we're underneath this as an overhead supply, the micro overhead supply inside of this balance range that's formed, I would tend to have a little bit more of a bearish tone. If we're underneath this area right here, which is very historically relevant on the hourly time frame chart at 438.50, that strikes me as yet again an offering of lower high consolidation. So then you have highs, lower highs. If this sticks, it's more lower highs trading into the equal lows at the bottom end of the overall balance range, of course, means that the threat is there for a breakdown into the NVIDIA earnings gap. Now, one thing that I would just encourage you to keep in the back of your mind whenever we're trading a channel, because this market has been, let's say, resilient and fairly relentless in terms of chopping around and going sideways, right? It's not really been doing a good job of trending in the NASDAQ 100. Do we want to jump the gun for a short at a known area of support? Ask yourself that question, right? Do you want to be a short right here? Or would you prefer to wait for the break lower high entry into the NVIDIA earnings gap range? That way you can manage your risk, right? If you're entering here on a lower high that's in development, you can easily manage risk with a stop above and start thinking about targets for the gap close closer to 425.75. One step at a time, but the idea is to keep risk management and location trade location at the forefront of your mind when we're trading near 433.75. What's the structure that's actually taking place? If we haven't broken underneath it yet, does it actually make more sense for the risk reward to favor a move back in the upward direction, right? Longs, stops, and then targets back to the midpoint, targets up to here, targets back to the top of the range. All of those things would be somewhat reasonable. Now, I do have my reservations about those particular ideas because of everything we've just discussed over in the S&Ps. We're going to see a lot of that reflected uh, into the NASDAQ as well in terms of weakness in the market internals, but also just understanding what's happening with small caps and the fact that breadth is contracting. We'll show you the QQQE, which actually made a lower low, right? So in terms of the QQQ daily time frame chart, key levels to be focused on. As long as we're underneath 433, the lower high is alive and well. It's even more bearish if we remain underneath 438.50. Obviously, breakdowns are into the NVIDIA earnings gap underneath 433.75. Let's drop it on down to the hourly time frame chart, see what else we can learn about the price action over here. Very similar comments. You'll notice that we didn't have aggression continuing from the sellers after the gap down from CPI. We close the gap and then find consistent rejections up against the low of the Tuesday session. Just like in the S&Ps, we also don't have stronger buyers. This was a short squeeze into the afternoon of Tuesday, and it's still happening on a huge offering of a lower high underneath the top, or I should say the bottom of the overhead balance range, the micro balance range that we were just referencing. That level is 433. So the trend here is down, right? Highs, lower highs, offering of lower highs. It would be very bearish if we were to consolidate down here. If we bring out the Fibonacci's from the Thursday high to the Thursday low, one interesting note here is that the QQQ did not make a new low underneath that. Thursday low. But if we take the same measurement, still the 38.2 keeps us in bear flag consolidation on today's session. And if we bring out the anchored view apps intraday, what we'll also notice is that we are underneath the cluster of all of them. So remaining below 438.50, I think we can clearly all agree on the hourly time frame chart. This is bearish consolidation looking for follow through into the bottom end of the range. One of the things we've been also talking about in the pre-market preps recently is the fact that I would prefer to see an initiation attempt around 433.75 before going in either direction. So what that means is trading down to this level, you have to recognize that you're still technically in an hourly downtrend. So I'm not thrilled about taking double bottom longs. I would prefer to see an attempt for, okay, maybe there's an attempt for support, then we break it, right? And on this attempt, an interesting thing happens, right? You get sellers who start to enter new money short positions. If this is truly going to turn into a look below and fail, and if the bottom end of the range is going to hold, those sellers then act as the fuel for the next leg higher if we can spot the higher low above. Now, of course, what's the caveat with this idea? It's that we don't know if there's going to be a lower high offering here for continuation into the downtrend. This is something that you actually have to determine in real time 
right? So that's the idea. But in terms of going long near the bottom end of the trend channel that we're just sort of seeing sideways in, I would prefer to see the fake breakdown to give me higher confidence, aka the fuel for the fire back in the upward direction on longs with an inverted head and shoulders or some sort of, let's just say that the daily bar prints out as a little bit of a hammer candle, long over the hammer high after testing these lows, failing to close underneath, long over that high looking for, again, it's still counter trend, just like we discussed in the S&Ps. Once we have a firm hourly trend reversal, Reversal, I'd start to change my tone a little bit more so in the NASDAQ on the QQQ hourly. Let's go ahead and jump on over to the market internals for the NASDAQ side of things. And just like the s and let's not try to like cover things up, right? There, there's no sense in doing that. You obviously have stronger sell side uh, outflows from the market, right? So we're not trying to be like, oh, we're looking for this look below and fail. No, as of right now, it certainly seems as though the sellers are the stronger group in the market. You'll also notice that we have this over-correlated move on the advanced decline line. So again, be thinking about over correlation, is there an opportunity for some snapback and does it change the trend? That's the key question to ask, right? If you look at the cumulative build straight shot lower, very substantial read. What was the number here? Negative 8,800 um, on the cumulative build out of the tick from the NASDAQ. Another component here, just to sort of uh, dive into, if you will, the end of day squeeze on Tuesday, notice that this does nothing. To the cumulative build, right? We're flat all day. So it shouldn't have really been hard to rebuild the cumulative. This is totally squeezed. This is not like we had stronger sellers getting involved into the close. If we had stronger, excuse me, stronger buyers getting involved into the close, my apologies there. If we had stronger buyers, it would have done something like what we had on Thursday, where all day we had bullish consolidation near the highs. And then there was the power to bring this thing down simply did not take place into the end of day on Tuesday to flip the cumulative build positive. So once again, trying to balance this analysis between saying we don't really Really have stronger buyers. It appears as though we have stronger sellers. There was new low, uh, no new lower low made here, but I would tend to still side more so with the sellers based on what's actually happening at the exchange level, noting that we are in an hourly downtrend here with consecutive lower highs underneath the anchored view apps. You guys get the gist as of right now. Let's finish up the NASDAQ side of the market with the market profile. First thing to point out is that we did not have a poor high to repair. We just had lack of material excess, and we didn't even breach that on the Monday session anyhow, so no issues out of that Monday bar. If anything, it's still equally as much a failure that the buyers were unable to rotate back up through this thin structure. If we take a look at the value area and point of control on this week's session, it is migrating in the downward direction. Here it is on Monday. Tuesday is a little bit deceiving because value is totally engulfing of what we had on the Monday session, but point of control is definitively lower as it is on today's session. Lack of material excess at the highs and lows. You're really just building out a balanced day on uh, today's session. So going back on over, let's go back to thinkorswim and give you some explicit pathing here. What I would be thinking about in the NASDAQ is consolidation here, breakdowns underneath today's low of day, trade us into the equal lows here. I'd be looking out for that because of the lower high. If we get a recapture and a higher low over 438.50, Nothing to really do in here. Nothing to really do in here. I'm not thrilled with uh, getting involved in the NASDAQ in particular in between this range right here. You might start to think, okay, maybe the, t you know, maybe the tide's changing and shifting if we're getting this acceptance. Maybe this is a failure at the bottom end of the range, but you're just in the midpoint. What type of edge do you have there? The answer is not much of anything. And lastly, for the broad market indexes, we have IWM, Russell 2000, and the small caps on a weekly time frame chart. Now, the intent here is not to do weekly analysis before the weekly bar actually closes out, but we have to recognize where we're trading in terms of location. This is the top of the multi-year weekly balance range, also offered a neckline as a double bottom over here before breaking out in early stages of 2024. We are coming in for a very aggressive retest, and if this level fails, if we fail back back down into the overall balance range, you can kiss this as a tailwind goodbye for your S&P 500. So we're going to begin there just to understand the importance of 199. As we drill on down to the daily time frame chart, let's evaluate what's happening in terms of trend. The trend I would say is neutral to slightly down here. Remember that we have lows, higher lows, higher lows, higher lows. This is an equal low. This is also concerning because we had lows, lower low, and this is just a lower low. So is the short term trend down in this area right here? I would have to argue the answer is yes, because we have highs, lower highs, lower highs. And today we did not close the gap overhead like we did in the S&Ps and the NASDAQ. You'll also notice that the upper wick of today's daily bar is a rejection of the bottom of this flush point here, as well as the daily 50 SMA. The equal low is a threat at that 199 level we just illustrated the importance of on the weekly time frame chart. And this indecisive doji doesn't really give me much hope that we have the buyers stepping up in mass to really support off of this area. Now, again, we have not closed 
closed out for the week. There is an opportunity for a move back in the upward direction, but it would appear to be just a counter trend move in the early stages of a developing downtrend. The other threat here that I'm sure the pattern traders are suggesting is that this turns into a massive double top. Here's your M pattern. You break down, you get a lower high, and again, you can kiss that tailwind goodbye for your S&P 500. The bullish idea here would be that we actually get a closure of the gap with acceptance above 203 as a level, previous flush point from in here, then you build out some sort of inverted head and shoulders. We're not there yet, and it's extremely speculative, but the daily time frame chart, that's what the buyers would want to see if this is going to remain as a neutral balance range. So you can start to see how the momentum, the buy side momentum in this market has certainly come to a grinding halt in the S&Ps, the NASDAQ, and even here inside of the Russell 2000 small caps, which as we know, again, is anybody surprised that a hot CPI print actually caused the gap to be there in the first place, but number two, not fill out of small caps? The answer should be absolutely not. Of course, we know that a hot CPI would sort of suggest that it's going to be higher for longer from the Fed. We'll take a look at the tracker tool in just a moment. And that, of course, has huge implications for operating conditions and small caps are very sensitive to that. Let's move on down to the hourly time frame chart. So this should be making sense, both technically and fundamentally on the gap down underneath this level, the rejection on the retest of 203 pairing with the fundamental story. On the hourly time frame chart, there's really not much more to say here other than the failure of this to act as an offering of a double bottom. Of course, the neckline would have been way up here anyways at 208.75, not even close. Obviously, we are underneath that as an area of support. As of right now, you can also see that the low of day break actually stuck a little bit more so. Intraday, we had a bit more of a downtrend out of the IWM instead of more of a sideways day like what we saw out of the NASDAQ and the S&Ps. Note, just in the market minder window, this is the easiest way to look at these things. This is the only red index on the day. The Qs were actually up 31 basis points. The S&Ps, 12 basis points. The IWM was actually down 12 basis points, right? So given that, uh, this weakness here should be impacting the S&Ps. And if the NASDAQ is going to break down, like we're no longer getting this tailwind from small caps, if the NASDAQ moves through the NVIDIA thin structure range, that to me is like a recipe for disaster in the S&Ps where we do ultimately receive some sort of larger pullback. So being mindful of that. Let's take a look at the Fibonacci retracements from the top of this leg all the way down to the bottom of this leg. And what you'll notice is that we're well underneath the 38.2, obviously trading near the equal lows, but even a gap fill reversal is keeping us below the 38.2. So if there's some sort of rally to close out the week on maybe some sort of oversold counter trend move, a gap fill reversal makes a lot of sense here. So if you're looking for longs, maybe there's a scalp on a break over 203 higher low here for something that does this. But I would just be thinking once again about shorts on the retest of 204.50. 38.2 is also offering resistance, keeping us in bear flag consolidation zone. Let's go ahead and take that off and instead take a look with our intraday anchored view apps. And these are loosely saying that you might not even get the break of 203 in the first place. Notice how these things are aggressively barreling down on us. They're going to provide resistance around this 203. And again, I think this is just a textbook move. Previous support, previous support is now acting as resistance. The trend is a little bit more firmly down on the daily time frame chart. We're coming into a major weekly threat. You know, in terms of context for the market, the IWM is not being helpful as of right now. We would prefer to see some sort of larger daily reversal pattern off of this area if we were to say, okay, this is just a very classic and standard break, retest higher low on the weekly, and then we're going to move in the upward direction. I think we want to be skeptical as of right now. And if we see the daily reversal, again, this is the if, huge, huge, if this is very speculative, if we see that we can start to change our tone and say, okay, maybe we're in the clear for now with something that looks like this. I think that we have concerns that are very valid considering the evidence that we've uh, approached and examined so far. The next downside target, if there is a break underneath that 200 slash 199 is closer to 194.25, right? This shelf of support acted as resistance support in here before the market actually started to get more in gear up and over the neckline of the double bottom from back over here. So that would be your downside reach target. Again, well extended through the lower edge of this week's expected move. Here we go with our market internals for the NAS, or excuse me, I was going to say NASDAQ Russell. Big outflows, again, no surprises over here, over correlated out of the advanced decliner, as well as bearish momentum in the cumulative tick. No surprises. Bears do have the upper hand from that point of view. And here is the market profile for the Russell futures. Big move on the gap down with value area, certainly lower point of control, not even close. You can see in C period, we have plenty of taper at the highs. We do not have a poor high in need of repair. 
and the lows actually lack material excess. So if anything, the lows are in need of repair. If we look to the left, another interesting note over here is that we were getting these very incremental higher highs out of the Russell futures. Were any of them able to come into the bottom of the thin structure over here? Not quite, not quite all the way there. So once again, if we ask ourselves, were stronger buyers involved in the first place on this counter trend move after the Thursday breakdown from last week, the answer still comes up as a resounding no. Let's take a look now at the weekly performance of our S&P sectors. Leading the pack here is the XLP consumer staples up 15 basis points on the week. And then we have to jump to the bottom end of the list because we go red. The XLE follows it up down 35 basis points and the XLU down 54 basis points on the week. All three of those sectors are lighter weight and certainly D4 defensive, which is fairly standard as the market is getting either compression of range if you're looking at a weekly time frame chart in this box or a little bit of a minor daily pullback. Uh, so no issues in terms of posture. Leading to the downside is the XLRE real estate down 234 basis points, followed by financials. This is where the pain really starts to set in. Financials down 166 basis points is not a good look when we consider that financials were the one risk on sector that were keeping this market propped up here near those all time highs. So that is concerning. And we'll take a look at that structural chart in just a second. Underneath that is the XLB materials down 157 basis points. Not really a big deal there. The XLB materials is extremely lightweight in terms of ranking. Let's take a look at the XLP. So structure, here we go. Breaking from our uptrend. Remember that this was a very clean upward trending channel. We've broken that. We are now rejecting for what appears to be a lower high attempt underneath the daily 50 SMA here in blue. I'm looking at this as a bit of a bear flag range. Don't get me wrong. The buyers are attempting over and over and over again to step up here, but it doesn't really seem as though uh, we're going to do anything constructive. There's still an offering of a lower high here, keeping us underneath the overhead balance range at 75. As long as we're underneath 75, this will be bearish pressure for the S&Ps drifting into a very minor downtrend. If we got a higher low above, I would be willing to change my tone. But next up, we'll move over to real estate lightweight sector. As we know, a little bit more D for defensive rate sensitive breaking down here. No surprises out of this one. If it makes a big new swing low underneath this loose 37 area, I'd be a little bit more concerned out of real estate as of right now, kind of eh, playing on the peripherals. Next up, we've got the XLF. This is where there is some concern we need to at least address. Look at this as a possible head and shoulders. We talked about the neckline in the weekend update. I was a little bit more fond and hopeful that this could have turned into a bit more of a bull flag here, but clearly a breakdown on today's session. The interesting component here is that bank earnings actually kick off on Friday with JP Morgan and Wells Fargo reporting before the opening bell. So we'll see if this move to the downside ultimately sticks. Can we catch support over the daily 50 SMA? Wouldn't lose hope on the higher time frames, but in the interim, like the short term here, this is definitely bearish pressure if we're under the neckline at 4142. So this breakdown is substantial and noteworthy. Next up, we've got the XLB again. How's it doing in terms of swing highs, swing lows? It's breaking down through this area. It's kind of closed right on it. Not a make or break for the S&P. So we're going to move along. Here's the XLI. Industrial is about 8% of the S&P still stuck sideways in this balance range. It is not a threat yet. If we break down underneath this previous resistance at 122.75, be a little bit more concerned. But as of right now, this is a neutral data point for the S&Ps. What about the semiconductor ETF? There are some bearish things taking place over here. It's very fond of the multiple gap fill reversal attempts here, as well as here on the hammer candle. Obviously, Thursday broke us down. We started to drift back higher. Notice now, though, the lower high underneath the original balance range from over here, right? So this lower high on Tuesday, now looking a little bit more confirmed on today's Wednesday session with the upper wick, creates a flush point, creates an H pattern, whatever you want to call it, underneath this 219.70. The door is basically open to the neckline of what could be construed as a double top, right? Something that does this, break down under that neckline, fail the daily 50 SMA at 212. NVIDIA earnings gap is in play. And this, of course, would strike me as bearish pressure for the S&Ps. We have to acknowledge that it's not rainbows and butterflies inside of semis anymore. The momentum has simmered out. We're cooling off. You need to acknowledge that we're no longer in a rainbows and butterflies type environment. Next up, we've got the XLV. What's happening in healthcare? This is certainly detrimental to the S&Ps. Someone corrected me recently, and I'm very thankful for that. So if I ever say something and misspeak, please correct me in the comments section. The XLV is now the third heaviest weighted sector, and the XLF, as it was breaking to new highs, is now the second heaviest weighted sector. So thank you for the correction. And you'll notice that even though it's still the third heaviest weighted sector, it's still breaking down, and it's still offering bearish pressure to the S&P. We're underneath this as an overhead balance. This is offering a lower high. We created a lower low today. So I would be thinking about this as bearish 
pressure. So when we start thinking about the heavier weighted components of the market, XLF breaking down today, XLV, which has been in a downtrend for a little while now, SMH, not directly in S&P sector, but as we'll see in the XLK, right, going sideways and really looking like a threat underneath and into the NVIDIA earnings gap. So highs, lower highs, lower highs, equal low, equal low, equal low, this massive flush point, right? Underneath 20390, with the weakness we're seeing out of healthcare, with the weakness we're seeing out of financials now breaking down, what's left to save the market? There's really nothing, right? So I wouldn't be surprised if some of this bearish tension actually resolves with a bit of a breakdown. Now, if the XLV, because remember, we never want to be short in the hole on a lower low, let's go back to the XLV. If this starts to catch a bid and move back in the upward direction, could that neutralize some of the impact in the S&Ps? I think the answer is yes, but for the most part, the structure has certainly changed here. That's worth acknowledging, right? Next up, we've got the XLC communications. What do we see out of comms? Uh, just going sideways in this balance really strikes me as a neutral data point. It's not as heavy weight in terms of the S&P, so it's not make or break, but it's certainly not harming us as of right now. XLY, what do we see over here? This is a little bit heavier weight. This is the fourth in the lineup of the sector weighting. And you can see that we're offering a double top neckline, possibly breaking down. This is a lower high from here to here. Indecisive doji on today's session. If this starts to slip in the downward direction, that is not going to be helpful. At that point, you would have all four of the major market sectors not working in favor of new highs out of the S&P 500, right? The structure is either neutral or bearish in those big four. Next up, utilities. How are we doing over here in utilities? Ah, oh, look at that. Chart looks great. Look at this beautiful retest, previous area of resistance. Oh, wait, what's the issue here? This is a lightweight and D for defensive sector, so it doesn't really or it shouldn't really have the power to bring the S&Ps back up to new all-time highs. So although it's going sideways, you know, it, it really strikes me as being fine considering the condition of the market. It's not a glaring red flag. It just kind of is what it is. It's very natural in a, in a market condition like what we have currently. So here's the XLE energy inflation. It's going to come roaring back. And I do believe like in, it, this is maybe a little bit uh, personal and subjective instead of objective looking at the charts. But I believe that energy inflation, so we just had huge, huge upticks out of auto uh, transportation services, basically auto insurance. We'll see this on the CPI. But the next issue for the inflation reports is going to be energy right? How could it not be with a massive breakout here of the monthly time frame bull flag we've been referencing? I mean, I know it's way off to the left of your screen, but there you go. There's the flag breaking out new all time highs basically over that $100.25 mark. I mean, you're rocking and rolling here right into the summer months when transportation and travel really starts to see an uptick. So somewhat concerned out of that. Again, upward pressure is still upward pressure for the S&P at the end of the day. But in terms of what it means for inflation, trying to connect the dots here, I suppose we could take a look at crude oil. Uh, one of the things we can discuss while we're looking at crude, if we just drop this back down to a daily time frame chart is the tensions overseas, right? And one of the interesting things that has taken place here, let's actually go 15 minute time frame chart, just so we can really, really start to see this. This is kind of ugly. Uh, this is not set up for futures this is the improper chart, but you get the idea. This is interesting to me, right? This is where we accelerated on the Middle East tensions. We finally broke down underneath that earlier on in the session. Look at the end of day close. That to me is once again starting to say, okay, from a technical perspective, oil looks like it could go higher. If this breaks out over this level in here around $87 a barrel, I mean, who knows what that's signaling about possible thoughts geopolitically overseas. I mean, the markets are fairly sophisticated and tend to get ahead of this stuff. That's why the reaction was so sharp there on Thursday of last week, while rates kind of did nothing. So interested in seeing how crude resolves just as a sort of add on to what we were just referencing over here in energy in terms of inflation. Let's keep this show on the road. No cuts today. We'll jump on over to the sector ratios. If you're not familiar with the screen, check out the video tutorial in the top right hand corner. This is an issue and this is an issue. What did we just say? about the XLF, right? Because it's now the second heaviest weighted sector, it was the only thing propping markets up. Now that it's breaking down towards that 50 SMA, don't get me wrong, it's still, still certainly offering an opportunity for maybe a stair step in the upward direction, but it doesn't look nearly as good. You can't really afford to have this and this moving in the downward direction and still be bullish or at least risk on in the current context of the market. Here's the XLV. It is technically D for defensive. It's the third heaviest weighted sector now, so we'll have to adjust these, but uh, it's definitely not helping. It's not the end of the world in terms of risk on, risk off, though. XLY, also not a help. So these big three moving in the downward direction kind of spells trouble for the S&Ps. This is okay. It's not the, you know, it's not going to make or break us. This is okay. It's not going to make or break us. Uh, XLP trying to curl higher here. The utility sector relative to the S&P actually isn't 
like overwhelmingly, oh my goodness, risk off is around the corner. So noting that this has not broken out for a major new higher high, somewhat interesting there, somewhat interesting. Let's get a little bit more specialized with some of these interesting ratios. Here's the XLK over the SHY government backed, right? You can clearly see we're just pinned right at that 50 SMA. Looking for the resolution of this tight range, right? If you were to come in here with some sort of trend lines and do something that looks like this, there you go. We're sort of wedging. Doesn't mean that it has to resolve right here, right now. But when we do this or this, we will have additional data points for risk on versus risk off. As of right now, with the drift for these lower highs. Technically speaking, you have a lower low in here. You're getting a lower high into the 50 SMA. I'd be inclined to say that it wouldn't be unreasonable for a breakdown, sort of skewing some of the perspective uh, to a little bit more risk off compared to risk on. Uh, we skipped one here, but here's the XLY over the XLP, still neutral inside the midpoint of that range, not really telling us much. Let's take a look at the one we skipped though, because this is still offering a breakdown of the neckline, if you will, of a head and shoulders, right? Here is left shoulder, head, right shoulder, breaking down through the neckline, as long as it's underneath 3.21, not really looking great for the S&Ps as a whole. Let's move along to our final SMHXLV. This is looking okay. So a balance of data points may be skewing a little bit more risk off compared to risk on, especially remembering just the overall context of this grid here with bears, 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 sort of doing some damage to what we have. Let's move along to our dollar, the dollar ripping to the upside today. No surprises on that with a hotter than expected CPI. We'll dive into the report in just a moment, but clearing this area here, here at 104.85 opens the door for at least a move to 105.65. The bottom of this is overhead supply. If not, a break through that. We'll see how PPI, producer price index, comes in tomorrow morning. That could be the fuel on the fire to continue accelerating in the upward direction, which of course has negative implications for equities down below. Let's take a look at the gold contract. Pulling back a little bit here, no surprises, seeing that the dollar is uh, certainly higher there. And if we move, let's actually take a look at silver as well. Uh, we continue to neglect silver a little bit. As long as silver pulls back for something over 26, I would be looking for gold actually to find a higher low pullback over. I mean, this is a very deep retracement. I don't know that I would look all the way for 2190, but consolidation up here, something of that sort would totally be reasonable. If you could get another mirror image of this flag from here, something that does that up here, I think gold can persist in the upward direction. And gold has been sending a warning, right? This warning is basically that investors are somewhat fearful of inflation as, as a hedged inflation, right, in currency, gold is sort of rallying there. So is anybody surprised that gold did this in the face of a CPI that came in hot? I mean, it sort of makes sense, obviously, in hindsight, but we have hinted at that through multiple of the uh, weekly updates that we produce here on the channel. Let's take a look at the TNX, the 10-year interest rate here, is breaking back in the upward direction. So we started to drift lower on Tuesday, right back up over this breakout point. And as we know, this in theory should continue to put some downward pressure on equities. Let's take a look at the T. L, excuse me, not the TLT, the inverted ZT. This is the two-year, uh, the best we can look at in terms of thinkorswim, breaking in the upward direction. So again, the evaporation of the expectation of rate cuts for June is certainly what we got today. Let's take a look now at the tracker tool and see it in real time. So there you have it. I mean, you can clearly see that we will be higher for longer based on the new tracker tool results. I mean, 81% odds of a pause in June. Now, the first cut being forecast for September of this year. And the reason that this is such an important issue to dive into is because if we take a look at corporate earnings for Q2 of 2024, you can actually see that this is where we were looking for the market to bail us out, right? Those rate cuts were going to bail us out of this trough that we had experienced and then look for acceleration in the upward direction. And we had the interns run the math. If you use $57 per share for Q2 of 2024, given the current PE multiples of the S&P, it actually reprices us to 48.50. And again, the idea here is not to say that we are going going directly to 4850. The market has to go there. That's what Matt said the math says. That's not the idea. But speaking in terms of directional vectors, 4850 is a whole heck of a lot lower than 5200, right? So could the market have to reprice some downside? I think the answer is yes. Another reason why we know that it would be very unlikely for the Fed to cut in the June timeframe, this has been my primary reasoning, is just that the labor market remains incredibly strong. So forget about the hot CPI print this morning. We know that inflation is coming back. And I'll show you some charts there in just a second. But tomorrow morning at 830, I'm actually less interested in the PPI and more interested in seeing how the unemployment claims come out for the initial weekly claims. Do we start to see a spike? Is the Fed going to be pitted between a rock and a hard place saying, oh my goodness, the labor market's starting to break. CPI is coming back with a vengeance. Oh my goodness, what do we do? That would be the worst possible situation for the market. As long as the labor market remains somewhat stable down here and initial 
claims on the week over week read remain, you know, underneath that 250,000 threshold, I think we have some room to stay higher for longer for at least one more cycle, even if it's just the market's perception of higher for longer, right? One additional note here is that the bond auction did not really go well this afternoon. But let's take a look at some CPI data here. This is the diffusion index courtesy of Michael McDonough on Twitter. We'll always shout him out great charts from the terminal. But the idea behind this chart is that the components of the S&P that are providing over 4% lift to the actual number is 66.64%. The components that are actually helping bring inflation down is only 20% of the actual CPI read. So to see this move, this purple line moving in the upward direction, suggesting that more components of the CPI are actually adding over 4% inflation, that is not a good look. This trend in the upward direction needs to be avoided at all costs. We would like to see this continue in the downward direction with lower lows, but unfortunately, it's just not the case. So is inflation going anywhere anytime soon? This would tend to suggest the answer is absolutely not. If we take a look at this, this is the difference between the three-month annualized change, right? So you can see that all items, less food and energy, kind of, you know, not great, but not as bad as services. What do we know about services? Services are the sticky side of inflation. And what's been going on with services? This actually looks like a new budding uptrend with lows, higher lows, highs, and higher highs printing on today's release. You'll notice that the overall annualized is stuck in this balance range. And although, yes, we did get a couple of constructive reads at the 2% mark, which is the Fed's target overall, we're back over 4% on the three month annualized change. So like, we're not even, this, this should not be thought of as like, okay, inflation's dead, the Fed won the battle. It's not even close based on some of this evidence. So what was the largest issue on today's report? It was the auto insurance contribution. Look at this huge uptick out of auto. I mean, it's just been becoming more and more of an issue. If you actually look at the CPI report, it's reflected as transportation services. Auto insurance is, you know, this has been a huge influence. Insurance as a whole, homeowners insurance. I know that everybody Everybody in Florida, some of those flood states. I mean, California is just a nightmare, right? So insurance is acting as a huge contributor to uh, these sort of inputs. And it doesn't like those things are going to stay high and remain high, right? Those things don't just magically go down because the market's like, oh, I think we're going to give everybody a break. That's not how it works. So seeing this type of information is not really, you know, rainbows and butterflies for OK. Jerome Powell is going to say, no, we're going to remain data dependent and, and sort of start cutting rates because we think that we won the battle. No, he's absolutely going to say, no, we didn't really get the information we wanted for uh, the release in April here, and we're going to have to stay higher for longer. Like, that's totally within the realm of what he could talk about, considering how he's postured himself here. Let's move along to the earnings calendar, because as we know, into the end of this week, it's the heavy hitter, JP Morgan. Mr. Demon will show us what types of tricks he has up his sleeve, and we'll see how that impacts the XLF as a sector. I'm highly attentive to that on Friday before the open. This is going to kick off our earnings cycle, and then beyond Beyond this, we'll start moving into some of the heavier hitting tech towards the tail end of April. We'll, of course, keep you updated on the uh, fact set report as well. But for now, watching Friday before the open, JPM, JP Morgan Chase, and WFC Wells Fargo as the two big components in the XLF. So let's move on over to some risk appetite charts. The TLT ratio to the S&P continues to drift in the downward direction, seemingly not indicating any flight to safety style trade. But if you actually take a look at what happened here, we did break down fairly aggressively underneath this area of support. And in my view, it's just a duration issue, right? Nobody really wants to take the opportunity cost of a 20 year bond when the two year is actually screaming in the upward direction. If we take a look at bonds in relationship to themselves, we've got the shortest duration up top, right? And this actually printed the best higher high out of the sort of ratio. And all this would suggest is that people are flocking back to those really high interest rate short term assets compared to the longer duration assets. And to me, it's not necessarily flight to safety. It's more like, let's take advantage of this. Everybody has that fresh in their memory, right? They don't want the opportunity cost of tying something up for a really long time. But if we can get record yields on short duration, let's sort of take advantage of that. So in my view, how this sort of plays out for equities is you get some like the mega cap tech, for example, staying somewhat stable, right? There's not going to be like this huge flush out of those companies, in my view, if you're just getting a flight to safety into incredibly short duration assets, just because there's a high yield on them, right? People are still going to want to take the opportunity cost for longer duration bets inside of equity. So I think that the relationship between this, and maybe this is a little bit subjective, um, is just that people may, might see a short term opportunity for some uncertainty in the market, but nothing that's like, oh my goodness, 
this, uh, in the next five years are going to be the hardest thing that we've ever gone through, right? And that could change, but that's certainly what uh, the market is sort of suggesting to me currently. Here we go with credit spreads, not really indicating any issues. A little bit more out of the short term, which is this uh, lower ratio down here, SHY and HYG, trying to find that higher low, but certainly not accelerating rapidly in the upward direction where a credit event would certainly become forefront. The HYG becomes a little bit of an issue, right? So if we're talking about risk appetite for the market, just now that this is in isolation and we're not talking about things relative to each other, HYG breaking down has to suggest that there is less risk appetite making this new lower low compared to when we were at least consolidating sideways in this range, which keep in mind was still divergent from the massive uptrend that we had in the S&Ps since the beginning of this year. So as a bearish data point supporting the suppression of risk appetite, the HYG underneath 7660 does strike me as a bearish takeaway. Let's move along to Bitcoin, which has done basically nothing. It's continuing to consolidate in this range, add the poll, and you've got yourself a bull flag looking for a resolution in the upward direction to new all-time highs over 74.1 over the course of time. And, you know, that would sort of be a minor counterbalancing point for risk appetite remaining somewhat stable. Here we go with new highs versus lows. This is where we can clearly see the sort of issue with market breadth contracting on the hotter than expected CPI back down to negative territory, unfortunately, out of market breadth, printing negative 16 on today's session. The saving grace would be if into the end of this week, we'd actually flip this back over the zero line and maintain a positive new highs versus lows reading. If we can do that, then again, this might just be a flash in the pan. If this develops worse and we start spending weeks underneath the uh, zero line in negative territory, huge red flag for the market. I would be thinking about a more substantial weekly pullback. Here we go with the SPX A200, our mild move in the downward direction, nothing really to be overly concerned about. SPX A50 are a little bit more so, looking for the bounce off of 50%. So if we're extended into the end of the week, if we're looking for that drawdown into 509 on the SPY cash ETF, if that's paired with an SPX A50R at 50%, then a rebound wouldn't be unreasonable after that 509 support area is interacted with. Let's move along to the RSP equal weight S&P 500, breaking down underneath this level here, clearly a lower low, offering a lower high. So daily trend is down. Things certainly get continuously dangerous underneath 163.60s out of the RSP. Notice that on a relative basis, we just have the equal high, excuse me, equal low on the S&P weighted, right? The same thing can be said here about the QQQE breaking down for a lower low, whereas the weighted has a higher low. So as we're thinking about breath contracting, it's happening across the board, not just in the IWM and small caps. It's in the NASDAQ. It's in the S&Ps. Let's take a look at the Dow. What's going on with the industrial average versus transports? Transports fading off of the upper portion of the balance range that we were oh so hopeful for a breakout up and over simply never took place. So we're back in the midpoint of this range. Of course, that would suggest that a bit more of a further pullback in here in the industrial average would not be unreasonable. Moving along to the VIX, what's going on with volatility? It's elevated and it's staying elevated, which is fairly interesting. This is uncharacteristic of what we've had so far since the October pullback or drawdown, I should say, of last year. A little bit of a spike in early February just to go right back down underneath the 15 handle. You can see we're acting as support now. So if this is going to break out, and again, you wouldn't use uh, typical technical analysis here, but the idea is if you're remaining elevated, if you're over 15 and things continue to get worse, I mean, not that it's a bull flag breakout, not that you would trade it that way, but it would certainly imply that the market is feeling a little bit uncertain, which is typically associated with drawdowns, right? If we take a look at the VIX, the party may not have even started yet. Uh, typically, what we're looking for here is the 103 handle. If we breach that, that's like, okay, put your big boy pants on. As of right now, we're okay. We're trying to stay over the 90 mark here over this previous swing high. If it fades back down to the downside, I would say, okay, VIX is probably going to come down as well. If this never gets over 103, I probably wouldn't be thinking about like a retest of 480 in the S&Ps for the previous all-time high. If this is over 103, if this is like, oh my goodness, we're trading up here 120s, probably talking about 480. We're just not there yet in terms of volatility. Let's take a look at the one-day VIX. I keep getting these menus wrong. My apologies there. You can see volatility futures still in contango, but working towards that backwardation near the zero line. Not, not there yet. So not a concern. Nine versus 30 day VIX is saying that we're all right. One day VIX is a little bit unresolved. You can see that it remains high. So typically you're not going to see the one day VIX stay elevated around this 2145. So something to make note of here is that if implied volatility is going to crush into the end of this week and we get some sort of like gap down open again, this is not like a tradable instrument, but generally the idea would be if you get this gap down open and the, and like, or even 
even if we open here and then move lower, you'll notice that there are only very few select red bars on this chart. But if we get one into the end of this week, that would certainly suggest volatility is contracting. Uh, and therefore, the S&P is probably going to rally on volatility contracting. So if you notice, we open over 1275 and actually break underneath it on the day's session, trading back down to these lows, that would be a sign that you probably don't want to be short the S&Ps. You probably actually want to be long looking for a bit of a squeeze for any poorly located shorts. So overall, I think volatility cuts both ways as of right now. The most important takeaway in a VIX environment over 15 is that your stops need to be wider. Your targets obviously need to be wider. And perhaps that suggests that you reduce your position size to reduce net exposure via dollars to the market as a whole. Remember, we're in the business of managing risk. And these are things that you should certainly be thinking about as we're actively trading the market. If you've made it to this point in tonight's analysis, do me a favor and hit the subscribe button for 100K by May, and we'll kick things off on the core list of companies with Apple. What do we see here? This is an hourly time frame chart. We are definitely in an hourly downtrend with highs, lower highs, equal highs, lower highs, equal highs, lower highs on today's session. You can count the lows as well, drifting in the downward direction. The one interesting nuance is that some folks might argue this is a falling wedge, which is typically seen as a bullish formation. You guys know me. I like to keep it standard with horizontal levels. If that's going to break, fine. You could break the resistance trend line, but show me the higher low over 169.80 before I'm flipping long out of Apple. After today's consolidation underneath 169, I would be inclined to say either shorts for lower highs continuing under that level are valid or looking for equal low breakdowns underneath 167. And there's some room to fall in the downward direction. Here's the daily time frame chart. Just as a reminder, this is a rhyme with what we have in this box right here. This is a larger version of what we have here. We are coming into this massive area of weekly support at 167. So be mindful if it breaks, it really could open the door into that 162.75. If it starts to act as support, again, I'd keep an open mind down here, but on the hourly time frame chart, I would require, not just nice to have, but require a higher low over 169.80 before I start changing my tone, noting the strength of the overall daily downtrend we've been in for a while, ever since we sort of topped out in December. Next up, we've got Softy. What's going on with Microsoft? Building out a balance range, trying to find a hammer over the 419.25 previous area of resistance. If we take this one on down to the hourly time frame chart, it's not really offering a whole lot inside of this range. I was trying to act fairly constructive to the upside on consolidation above as of Tuesday's close, but today, unfortunately, just put us right back in the midpoint of that range. So sure, we found support, we found buyers over 419.25, but what are you going to do in here? I think the day trade that could unfold could be a scalp on a higher low over that level, but I would be an aggressive profit taker. We know that this range has been fairly nasty to trade. We haven't really seen much follow through up and over the top or down and out underneath the bottom. So I'd be an aggressive profit taker sort of locking things in as they're offered to you here out of Microsoft. The constructive trades here, of course, would be the big break there and the big break here to the downside underneath. I'll give you the level 419.25 and up here is 426.75. Next up, we've got Google L. What's going on with Google? You can see that we're getting bullish consolidation near the all-time highs. This is setting up a pressure cooker top, if not a pie in the sky, inverted head and shoulders. Love the possible opportunity, not guaranteed, but possible opportunity up and over 156.85. If we can snap that level, you've got thin structure retracement in the upper wick of the first hourly bar of Tuesday, then looking at blue sky territory. So very interested in that setup. If we do pull back, I'm looking for a daily higher low here at 153.15. Next up, we've got Amazon. What's going on with Nancy? It's been a wild one, but uh, it is trying to remain somewhat constructive on the acceptance, at least over the key level at 184.75 uh, here. So if this bull flag wants to break, I mean, there might be something to do over over 186 into the end of the week into these equal highs. But the best trade is really looking for the clearance there and the run up into blue sky territories, right? All time high is at 188.65. So trying to remain bullish, but they have not made it easy. Today's gap down, uh, certainly a little bit difficult to stomach if you're trying to fade that back in the upward direction. The higher lows here offered into the afternoon, though, as we've been talking about, somewhat uh, decent looking. Next up, so I guess the idea is just consolidation in here is neutral. 186 breaks get you to the equal highs. Better trade is this for blue skies. And if we're going to drift in the downward direction, show me a clear rejection. I mean, the sellers had the opportunity, right, on the gap down. Let's think about this for just a moment. Sellers had the opportunity for gap fill reversal and a week close near the lows. It simply didn't take place. I would argue this is actually a very strong.
strong close out of Amazon, one of the leaders on the day, up 1.74%. Uh, Next up, speaking of leaders, we've got NVIDIA. Huge rip back in the upward direction, but is it enough to turn it back into the one stock to rule them all? I don't think so. I certainly do not think so. I'm thinking of this as a lower high opportunity up against the bottom of this as a balance range, right? This balance right here really defines some of the characteristic trades we've taken recently, notably the lower high at 922 and some sort of a fade underneath that uh, 871.50. So right now, like to me, this, uh, this is just a lower high. This is an offering of a lower high. If we're thinking about trend, it's highs, lower highs, lower highs, lower highs. This could possibly be that lower high. So what's the level of interest? I mean, any sort of breakdowns underneath 865.50, I'd be trading into 853.75, excuse me, and then the lows down here at 837. I mean, the trend is clearly in the downward direction. Did you want to be a new money short at the lows uh, of the trend channel? Probably not. And again, another very easy way to visualize this is just doing something that looks like this. You probably don't want to be short down here. You you do want to be short up here. Uh, you probably don't want to be long up here, and you probably do want to be long down here, right? So as simple as that, uh, just in terms of visually referencing where you're at in a trend cycle. So sure, I mean, hourly traders could call it a bull flag, but I personally will be thinking about a lower high being offered and anything that does this, breaking down through some of this thin structure. Will I have to change my tone if the market breaks up and over 871.50? Absolutely. There's probably no bear trade if there's just a straight shot higher on an opening drive, and that's fine, right? That is absolutely fine by me. Next up, AMD. What do we see out of AM Dizzle? Uh, firstly, I want to go out to a daily time frame chart just to sort of uh, show and reference the higher time frame head and shoulders, right? That is in force, highs, lower highs, equal lows at the neckline. This is starting to look like a bear flag in the very short term. If we can snap these equal lows and notice that we did technically attempt it on today's session, right? Look at the lower low that was offered in here. We didn't really get much acceptance under that 164.60, but overall, I think as long as you're inside of this range, I would be thinking about the opportunity for the stronger downside move out of AMD. Big retest level on the daily chart is way down here at 150.35. That would be your larger down side target, probably the measured move as well of the bear flag, right? The head and shoulders would be much deeper than that. If you're going to take a measured move, it would be from here to here stacking that on the neckline. I mean, just visually, this is not very precise, but we're talking about maybe 115, not in play for the end of this week. That's for sure. We'll take it one day at a time out of AM Dizzle. Next up, we've got Metaverse. What's going on with Zuckerberg's Fantasyland? Beautiful hold of this area at 510.75. Meta has been acting, you know, we can rag on Mark Zuckerberg all we want, but the chart has been acting awesome. Awesome, awesome trading this week. Lower highs at the uh, 524 level today, holding this 51075. Pretty much textbook stuff. So, as a double bottom neckline, as long as we're over this level right here, looking good. Now, if you're not already long off of this or if you didn't take the trade here today, the next sort of setup would be can we get consolidation in here and then follow through up and through the equal highs at 52875? There is certainly the threat that 524 could act as resistance, but coming off of a daily higher low, I would be more inclined to say if the broad market sees any bit of a counter trend move. I'm thinking about meta up through the highs, not rejecting here again at 524. First test, best test. We already got it. I would not be trying to rinse and repeat that trade considering the daily higher low we just explored. Next up, we've got Tesla. What's going on with Mr. Musk? Can't seem to get in gear here. Um, just charts... It's very loose, and we've been describing this in the pre-market sessions. This price action is very loose. This gappy activity is fairly loose. A lot of volatility back here, fading a little bit back off of this resistance point. So it leaves a bit to be desired. And for that reason, I, I don't I don't see a clear trade here. So I'm not really going to comment on you know what this is setting up as. I think that you've just got this as a range. This is good, and this is good. If you're just in the midpoint. I don't know, flip a coin, I suppose. Next up, we've got Netflix. What's going on with Netflix? This has been the heartbreaker trade. It's been that way for a while. Looking for the gap fill reversal this morning did not pan out in the slightest. So I'm inclined to say that Netflix is almost like a no touch. I mean, the volatility in here has been insane out of a $635 product these days. So we'll sort of like take this at face value and just identify that, yeah, sure, we're getting the offering of a potential higher low, but you're back down once again underneath that 623. There was no higher low offering in here on this pullback for something that remained constructive and then maybe offered the breakout again. It just didn't take place. So if anything, you're just stuck in a volatile range where this is starting to build out as sideways, right? You've got highs, highs, lows, and lows. 
again, be my guest in the midpoint of the range. It's not really respecting structure in the cleanest of fashions recently. I don't really see the obvious uh, trade to take on Netflix. So just like Tesla, we will refrain from commenting on an ideal path. Let's move along to the three additional ideas. Visa is up first on the chopping block. You can clearly see a flush point, which is developing on the hourly time frame chart. But the idea actually comes from the daily time frame chart. You can see that we've got an inside bar on today's session. If we can flush those equal lows that we just saw, the target would be the opening print of the large green body bar which is loosely around 167. So 167 as your target would be what you're aiming at to the downside. If it just consolidates in here, it's in play. If we break to the upside over 278.50, not as interested in Visa. Next up is going to be PG for Procter and Gamble. What's going on with PG? Uh, certainly looking for a thin structure retracement in the opposite direction. So you've got a short idea out of Visa, and we know that the XLF is struggling, right? And now you've got a long idea out of PG. So up and over these bear flag highs, which we've closed over today, over 157, if we can sustain that, uh, we're looking for thin structure retracement. Notice how this was just one hourly bar in the downward direction of your target. Let's give you the number. I'm inclined to say the opening print of that bar here at 159.65. You guys know the rules, round numbers only up here in the penthouse. There we go. That is feeling much better. So as long as this can hold, right, you could even argue that this is cup and handle. You could argue it's rounded bottom, inverted head and shoulders, whatever. Over 157, that's the idea, right? So back to the daily time frame chart. Not interested if we're under 157. Obviously, there's no long in here. Certainly no long if we're breaking down through the equal lows. Last trade idea, number three, is going to be on NKE Nike. What do we see out of Nike? It is a flush point, and this requires not even looking at the daily chart, but looking at the weekly chart. So nobody's buying shoes, it looks like, and you've got yourself a daily H pattern off of a lower high, equal lows. It's a flush point. So here it is on the hourly, just to describe how precise these lows are, one, two, and three. Break down through that. So under 88.75, let's go back to the daily time frame chart. What's your target? I don't know. Let's zoom out. Oh, that's not enough time. Okay, let's go out to that weekly we were just referencing. Look at this. Nike weekly chart looks horrendous with these big, massive lower highs here and here coming into this equal low flush, which is it's, it's right on the money, right on the money to this prior low. If we break down underneath that, this is the target. And that's going to be at 8315 as a possible trade that you could hold on to for a couple of days as long as the risk management makes sense. So that is Nike. And that is going to do it for this week's episode of the Midweek Market Update. If you learned anything new or enjoyed tonight's episode, let me know down below in the comments section or by giving the video a very simple thumbs up. Remember that we're trying to hit 100,000 subscribers, which is a very ambitious goal for May, 100K by May. We're almost there. Um, and we'll be live tomorrow morning, 8.15, pre-market prep for the PPI, live market reaction, no coffee, excuse me, no donuts, but coffee on me for that release. And as we mentioned earlier, much more interested in how the unemployment report, initial jobless claims actually comes out. Is that an issue or is it not? We will find out tomorrow morning at 8.30. With that said, everybody have a green trading week, and I will see you in the next one.